Hello, everybody. It's the American Doofus Show. I'm your host, Barry Welsh. Don't be a doofus. We're going to be live tonight at 9 p.m. And uh, I've got to give a disclaimer. I, I neglected to do this in the past. Um, the opinions and views of guests are theirs and theirs alone and not part of, uh, not necessarily mine or the show's. Um, since Saturday, we've had Darren Harris on to give a personal view of, uh, of things. Um, we're going to talk more about Darren tonight uh, on the live. Uh, we also had Dave Blackford on uh, to give us uh, a Louisville view and uh, also a legal perspective. We'll talk more about that as well. Tomorrow, we're going to have two guns back on to talk about uh, uh, views of uh, from an independent militia standpoint. And um, also the good works the, the young man's doing in his community. And again, I want to put a, uh, a call out to anyone that is a, a member of a 3%er, 3%, 3% militia. Um, because of monolithic thinking, basically. Monolithic thinking is all white people are this way, all black people are this way, all 3%ers are this way. And uh, this show is all about giving different views and different perspectives. And um, because if we only look one way, we only see one thing and uh, we only see one side. And there are, um, all, there is always more than one side to a story. And of course, uh, on this episode, Chris is back with us. Chris, a former uh, Department of Defense contractor specializes in security, has his own security company and uh, operates around the world. And um, Chris is basically going to give us his assessment of, of what happened and didn't happen uh, in Louisville on Saturday. And um, we, keep, we, we keep Chris's identity secret because he's in the security business. And, you know, Chris may not even be his real name. Um, he may not live in the United States and they're, you know, we're keeping things, um, confidential because of his business and of his work. Chris, I want to start out by asking how important is keeping an identity secret, uh, to a militia? Um, in my perspective and in things that I've seen, it's really not that important. Okay. Okay. Um, it's because most militias are actually community based. Okay. So since you're dealing with the community on a daily basis, people are going to know who you are. Okay. And, and uh, let me give you an example. Even though uh, the Black Panthers weren't really a militia, they were a self-defense group. And, and, but there's always um, a baseline of what these self-defense groups do. And, and Black Panthers specifically, we're actually really good at this. Um, at, at getting community support. That's why they were actually very, very successful at what they did. Now, you can't be anonymous dealing with the community. You, you just can't be, right? So people, so people in the community knew exactly who they were and exactly what they did as far as when it came to social programs, okay? Um, and even protecting uh, the community. Everyone knew who they were. So you being... Um, anonymous really doesn't help your cause. Okay. It, from what I from what I've seen, and then you know from what I know, all right. A lot of, a lot of groups do that, but I'm like, why is this group doing that? It's it's kind of silly. And it's you know, and here's one thing I've noticed about um, this group is that they are not community based at right. all. Right. So therefore, even when they went to Louisville, Kentucky, all right. A lot of people were saying they didn't want them there. And some people did, some people didn't. Right. Right. But the whole thing about it is for something like that to um, take shape, you need the community to back you 100, 100% to really be effective in that environment. And I also noticed that with uh, Angry Viking, how people were saying, well, we don't want you here. You just can't come from wherever and go on someone else's turf and think like you're just gonna think you're gonna run it. It doesn't work that way, right? If if they were probably met with the, the community leaders, right, and said, hey, look, you know, this is what's going on. Do you think you know 
would you allow us to come in and do X, Y, and Z, you know, here in your city? Okay. The community leaders would have been like, well, no, we don't want you here. Or yes, you know, we can do that. But neither one of those two groups even did that. It didn't seem like, I, I was under the impression from observing that the NFAC and, and the group of protesters, specifically in Louisville, had coordinated, but, but from appearances, that wasn't the case. Right, and, uh, and, and, and I can take that directly to uh, when they were at uh, Churchill Downs. And uh, I guess that, that one group of protesters was behind them. Um, you know, it goes to show that Grandmaster Jay did not have a contingency plan, okay? Because if he did, um, he could do what we call as a frago, right? A fragmentation order, right? It's just basically where we change things up on, you know, uh, in like a split second, okay? So he could have gone back and spoke to the leaders okay, of whatever group that was and said, hey, you know what, we need this space because of X, Y, and Z. If there's any shooting that occurs, we don't want any of your people to get hit. So, you know what, could you move down a little bit further or could you, you know, move back or could you, you know, either move left or move right, you know, just as long as we don't get, you know, smashed in the middle between all that. And he like, he failed to do that. So I'm kind of looking at him like, okay, you're the leader, but you have this group behind you and you didn't address them with the other leader. And that could actually been uh, resolved right then and there, even before, actually, even before they, they, they stepped off uh, from uh, their staging area. That all that stuff could have been handled right prior to that. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I guess I'm looked at as devil's advocate at times, but from I'm trying to look at it from Grandmaster Jay's side, uh -huh. and and I I can't imagine the pressure he had on him um, during that time period it, as 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 the leader and basically as responsible being responsible um, for the safety as you said of the protesters behind him. Can you talk about from a leadership standpoint, the kind of the kind of pressure you feel when uh, uh, when you're potentially in a dangerous, if not deadly, situation. All right. First of all, you have to know how to prepare the battlefield. All right. Battlefield preparation is is <laughs> that's like paramount. All right. So if if you're not prepared on the battlefield, then everything. If, yeah, you're gonna feel pressure because you don't because you haven't prepared you know and and there, we always had a saying that you know piss poor planning promotes piss poor performance piss poor performance promotes pain okay and this is exactly what happened on uh, uh saturday with um in fact okay because they did not plan properly right you always have a contingency plan if if your original plan fails they didn't have a contingency plan okay so um i think they i think their objective or I think they had uh, maybe two objectives. One was to see that one of the officers or the officers involved in the Breonna Taylor killing was um, arrested or, you know, and two was uh, to disrupt the uh, Kentucky Derby. And actually they failed on both of those objectives. Okay. Um, they went back down. They got nothing back from the attorney general or from the governor in reference to Breonna Taylor case. So, they failed on that objective. And then two, uh, they were supposed to disrupt the uh, Kentucky Derby. Now, the governor two weeks ago said, hey, you know what? Yeah, uh, we're gonna have this thing wrapped up by the 5th of September, correct? He said that, okay. And he said, you know, the, the Kentucky Derby, um, is gonna, is, we're still gonna have it. But he didn't sit there and say there weren't gonna be any spectators. You see what I'm saying? So, right. you know, Grandmaster Jay went down there thinking, you know, hey, you know, we, we got them now. We'll go, we'll go to the, uh, the uh, uh, Churchill Downs for the Kentucky Derby and we'll stop. We can, you know, we'll stop the, the, the um, spectator from going in, which basically blocks the money. But then also you have 
all the people coming in from the hotels and everywhere else, right? The the restaurants, and they Absolutely. weren't there, and they weren't there. You see, so um, what did Grandmaster Jay really accomplish? Nothing. He got everybody home safe, and to me, so, okay, that, okay, that, yeah, okay, that's right. what I wanted from everybody. All right, all right, on on yeah, from that standpoint, of course, you know, he took his people in and brought them out safely. Okay, that's that's actually what you're supposed to do. All right, but from the other two objectives, he failed. Okay, yeah, okay. I, what about from the angry Viking perspective? That was just a waste of his time to even go down there. And like I said, you have to have the community to back you on, on you know, what, what you're trying to get done. If you don't have that community support, you're going to fail. You're an outsider coming into someone else's territory, someone else's turf. They're not going to back you. You just you think you're just going to come in there and think you're going to take over. That's like an occupying force. You know, and the people are listening. That, that's how you get people to turn against you. You see? Yeah, I do. If, if he would have gone in and said, hey, um, I like to meet with, you know, I like to meet with your leaders, the community leaders, and this is why we're here. Um, this is what we would like to do. Do you have any problem with that? Okay. They didn't even do that. They just went down there. We're going to, we're here because Grandmaster Jay and NFAC said they're going to burn the, you know, burn what you will call it down, yeah. move it down to the ground. And Grandmaster Jay is like, well, no, yeah, we said that, but that we, it was a figurative in, 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 uh, right. you know, it wasn't literal. It right, was right, figurative. Right, figurative, right. So, and, and they were at Churchill Downs. So that other group was pretty much like, okay, well, there's not a whole lot we can do. So, I mean, they're kind of like, they just wasted their time just by going down there and they just made a show and what really came out of it? Nothing. How effective were they? They weren't. They just walked around Louisville. So, <laughs> Again, I've got to, I personally, I give kudos to the Angry Viking for de-escalating and getting, getting those people out of there. Cause that, and the whole time that incident was going on, I think I even commented on one of the lives that, that my friend Chris said, you know, the, the police could just stay out of it and let them go at each other. And, and that, that appeared like what was just about to go on. Right. Right. And, but you know, um, I think once they got there and they found out that the people didn't want them there, they just more or less just, uh, let's, let's leave. Yeah. You know, we just don't want to cause any problems at all. And furthermore, the police, trust me, the police and the national guard could have handled that situation without any problems. I I'm very serious. So, um, like the angry Vikings, I think would have just added more fuel to the fire than, than done anything else. I agree. I, I think if, if, uh, uh, I think if uh, NFAC had been at the square, uh, the angry Viking just being there at the square, that would have just, like you said, that would have just, that would have been a tipping point. Right, right, right. So, and, and then um, there's some, uh, there's something else that I wanted to discuss with you. Sure. In, in reference to, um, oh, you saw the numbers, in the formation, how they drop significantly, correct? Do you and, mean in NFAC? Right, right. They they they've dropped significantly. Now you remember the force, the first formation in um, Stone Mountain, mm -hmm. and then the second formation in Louisville. You you watch the two, the the numbers are actually pretty big, right? This formation, the numbers had dropped significantly. Did you notice that? I did not notice that. I, that was actually the next question I was going to ask was, there have been uh, lots of guesstimations as to how many uh, were there on, on the back the blue side and on the, the NFAC side. And I was going to ask what, what your estimation were for, for both. So go ahead. Okay. So the, um, I guess it'd be uh, Django. Um, Delta Django. From my understanding, it was his connections from different uh, black gun groups or black gun uh, clubs, and he brought them all over to the formations. Oh, 
Okay. But, but once that split occurred between uh, him and NFAC, he told all his people, you know what, no more formations. So, you know, all those gun groups that were there, that they, they made they made up the majority of the formation. You see, and then they came under, uh, I guess, uh, what was his name? Uh, Delta, whatever his name is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now, since since in fact and Delta are no longer, they have no no the relationship has been terminated between the two. Django has taken his people out, and now all there is is, uh, I guess Jay, and his people, which is around oh, I guess maybe around two hundred. So if you remember, it's probably around maybe four or five hundred people, for the for the first Louisville, um, formation, and maybe about eight hundred people for um, the very first formation at, at Stone Mountain. So you, Django uh, Delta had a whole lot of um, influence in, in gaining, you know, the force multiplication. Okay. So I, and that's kind of like what I saw. All right. And again, you know, there's also the, the possibility that uh, probably a probability that not 100% of NFAC showed up in Louisville. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, um, someone told me that um, they were actually limiting in certain areas uh, that there was uh, from Florida, somebody from Florida that said, no, we're full. We're not taking any more. Um, you know, there, we, we were only going to have this amount of people. And uh, and that's full, so you can't, you know, we'll see it the next one. Right, right, right. Because, you know, the whole thing about it is 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 when you're going with a show of force, okay, you want as many people there as possible. All right, that, that's that's the whole thing. Um, and, and you're limiting the people. I, whatever the reason is, I, I don't know. All right. Um, but you want as many people there as possible, right? Because, okay. because if something were to occur, the ultimate goal is for wh whoever side is to overwhelm them with superior firepower. That's the whole. That's the whole issue. Okay. okay. How many? How many um, angry Viking and followers? How many do you think was in that that group? I, you know, I heard there's probably about 250. You know, maybe a little bit more. So if in fact and um, angry Viking, let's just say. Uh, clashed. Um, I, I think tactically, the um, Angry Vikings crew probably would have outdone in fact, uh, because I, I was taking a look at um, Angry Vikings crew, and they seem to be a little bit more tactical and, and, a, and a lot more. They act, actually, they were very tactical. In, in the way that they were doing things as opposed to NFAC was. Now, you have to remember, I'm also a tactical officer. Right. So, and so how so? Go ahead. So, so I kind of, I saw like I'm, I'm, I'm picking up on these things. Okay. I'm, I'm taking a look at their, at their, at their presence. Okay. How they're carrying their weapons. Okay. How they're moving in formation. Um, how they're sitting with the weapons when they get up with their weapons. I'm just like, okay. That's in fact, I'm just like, okay, these guys really aren't on point. All right. A lot of people think that they are, but those are, those are of course, people that don't have experience in, in the tactical realm. Right. Um, now I took it, took a look at angry Vikings people and I'm just like, okay, they're a little bit more squared away. Okay. But here's the thing. Um, in the world of the military and special operation forces, there aren't a whole lot of African Americans that come out of SEALs, uh, Rangers, um, Special Forces, SF Green Berets, okay? Okay. Now, the majority of those people are white guys, all right? So I expect the white guys to be a little bit more uh, proficient with their firearms and, 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 and when it comes to tactical movements and tactical maneuvers, because that's who makes up the majority of Special Operation Forces. It's not African Americans. It's 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 the uh, white Americans. Is you know? is is that is it a is that because of race? I mean, is it because of racism that there are? You know what? Um, some say it is, but then a lot of times, um, sometimes they just don't because going through a selection and 
going through like uh, the courses, they're actually, it's actually really difficult. It's very difficult. A lot of times some groups of people just don't want to do that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because they're like this, well, I could get paid the same amount of money if I do this, right? And it's easier. Why do I put myself through all that aggravation and, <laughs> and, and you know, still get paid the same amount of money? So um, that, this is just my take on it from what I've seen. Um, and, and that's the reason why there, you know, a lot of those guys over there, um, on angry Viking side, I think, I think some of those guys are uh, a little bit more tactically proficient than NFAX people. 100%. Okay. All right. Uh, that's why I have different people on the show. I want different opinions and as you know, and that's what America should be. It's, you know, America, everybody has the first amendment right to say what they think. And, uh, I don't, I try not to hold anybody back. I try not to ever argue that you know, too many other shows doing that kind of stuff. Chris, I want to have you back on, um, to do, to talk about, uh, Rahola. Okay. Um, because that's going to be a whole segment of it in and of itself. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for your time as always and your expertise and, uh, um, this is the American Doofus Show. I'm your host, Barry Welsh. Of course, don't be a doofus. And again, uh, anytime we have guests, the guests are entitled to their opinions. They're free to express their opinions unencumbered. And uh, also, again, if you are uh, happen to be a part of a 3% militia, I wanna, I'd wanna like, like to talk with you. I'd actually, I'd like to listen to you because that's more what I try to do here. It's the American Doofus Show. Thanks again to Chris. And uh, we're going to be live tonight at 9 o'clock. You can bring your questions, your concerns, and uh, we'll talk about things. I'll, uh, I've got a few things to talk about, and then the rest of it will be questions and answers. So take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Um, I love you all. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Please like. Uh, please share. And uh, if you want to contact me, it is uh, AmericanDoofus at gmail.com or on Facebook, the American Doofus page, and uh, just send me a message. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Love y'all. Don't be a doofus. <laughs>